then joined the metrology department uh, uh, in 1995, and uh, since 2001, he's been a, a permanent, uh, uh, on permanent secondment, I guess, from Zeiss to uh, ASML uh, here in Arizona, in Chandler. Um, and uh, he's an SPIE fellow, uh, and today he's going to be telling us about EUV technology in the semiconductor in industry. So, welcome. Thanks for that introduction. That does sound though so like you're talking about my dad. <laughs> I think I got old. Do we have some? Yes, we do. All right, so thanks for having me. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'd like to talk today a little bit about EUV technology for semiconductor industry. Uh, who of you, oh, by the way, uh, I kind of like if people ask while, while I'm talking, so I'm perfectly okay if there's something that you can follow or if you think I'm too slow or if uh, there's something not clear, let me know. Um, what do, am I talking about today? First, I'm going to briefly introduce Carl Zeiss. Uh, who of you does not know what Carl Zeiss is? One. Good. At least one. Uh, then I will briefly go into uh, a little bit into what uh, chips are and so on. This is, of course, a, a huge, vast field, and we don't have the time, so I'll just have a couple small snippets. And... Uh, mainly to explain why why chips have to do with optics. And then uh, I'm going to dedicate the major portion of this to the new technology for chip making, which is extreme ultraviolet. So uh, Carl Zeiss is a company that was founded in Jena in Germany. That was the, uh, the East German part after the war uh, in 1846 as a maker of microscopes. So that was his building where he started this business in 1846. To just give you a, a reference, Geronimo was 17 years old. Who does not know Geronimo? Everybody knows him, right? So uh, that's where this whole thing started. And uh, be back then, just building microscopes. Uh, nowadays, Zeiss is a global company. We have a uh, the area where I'm working at, uh, making the lenses for chip making. We have a large area of research and what they call quality technology. That means everything that measures stuff, right? So we have 3D coordinate metrology. We have uh, interferometers. We have microscopes. Uh, all this falls in, into this category. We have a medical technology surgery microscopes, ophthalmology, uh, these kind of things. And then we have consumer optics. That's where most people know the name of Zeiss. Eyeglasses, binoculars, movie camera lenses, consumer camera lenses, and so on. Uh, Zeiss is now a worldwide company acting in uh, 40 different countries. Uh, we have more than 20,000 employees worldwide. Uh, it's currently a company that with uh, around 5 billion euro a year. Uh, we have 25 research and development sites, about 30 production sites, and the headquarter of Zeiss, this is this little town. You can argue whether it's a town or a village in South Germany. Uh, with the headquarters of Zeiss here and what I encircled here, this is where the uh, 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 semiconductor optics are being built. So that's a fab that was built in the 2000s. And I go there like every couple months. And now let's talk about uh, semiconductors. Uh, one thing that all those semiconductors, whether processors, whether memory, uh, all those have in common that you need transistors. And transistors, as they get smaller, you see here the technology node. This is actually a number. It's in nanometers, so it is a kind of used to be a measure of the size of the smallest feature of the chip. Uh, as of about, well, pretty much this whole axis is more like a not so much the dimension of the smallest feature anymore, but a kind of m the marketing guys got into this. So 
So the numbers keep getting smaller. It's the features also, but the number five does not mean that your smallest feature is five nanometers. But it's, that's what you call the five nanometer node. Uh, and then you need to be. Yeah, yeah, so it still is a mon monotonous relationship, right? <laughs> that that uh, with with a slope greater than than zero. <laughs> um, when you look at the transistor, so you have uh, 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 source and drain, what you call in in, in semiconductors. So that's where you basically you, you put the voltage in, and you see it comes out on the other end. The current comes out, and then you you switch the transistor with a gate, and those are field effect transistors. That means you put a voltage on this gate, and then your transistor either uh, shuts off or, or transmits current. And as you get smaller and smaller, the field that you that penetrates there into this into this uh, transition, uh, it it basically with these devices you have leakage current, and leakage current is a killer. First of all, it consumes power. Uh, it makes the you need higher voltage, so you need to reduce your leakage current. And that was the first ones who did this was Intel. They use FinFET. So now you have this basically that dark gray area is where the uh, where you switch. And now the, the dark gray, you have these fins, and the gate kind of wraps around the fins. So now the field can penetrate much more of that uh, geometric area. So the, every, you know, you go to an Apple store and buy a Mac or a Windows computer, uh, all the transistors that you have on your chips will be these FinFETs nowadays. Uh, that as you go further down the nodes, you will have nanowires. With, this is not existent today, but this is w where the technology is going to go to. The nanowire, now the gate really goes completely around your uh, the end transition, and now you have different configurations. So the industry still continues to shrink and shrink and shrink. One thing is, the more you shrink, the more transistors you can get onto your chip. The more transistors have, the more cool stuff you can do. But that's only the technology side of it. Uh, there's an economic side, which I basically point out here, is if you look at a company like Intel, they make and ship three trillion transistors per minute. That is why these things like to be also small, right? Because that's how you can make many, many, many of them at the, at, at the same moment in time. Um, same holds for, oh, maybe before I go there, uh, let me get back to this. Traditionally, the transistors happen on the silicon. That's why you use a silicon wafer, right? So you need silicon to have your transistors. So in all the chips that we have today, the transistors are the bottom layer. And then you build up contacts and metal lines which connect stuff. But the transistors are only on the, in the basement, uh, in, the, in the, what do you call it, the ground level, right? Uh, this has recently changed in memory. So what I, this is actually a little uh, movie here of a 3D NAND chip. So I bought this, uh, about a hard drive in January 2016, and we took it apart and put it in a SEM, a uh, size uh, cross beam. And then we made these iron etching and took SEM pictures, lots of them, and then you render this and put it back together. What you're seeing here is basically just the tungsten part of it. So all these holes that you have here, every hole contains material, which is not shown here because we put a threshold. But the intersection of every layer here with these columns that you have is one transistor. So now you're really in three uh, stacking transistors in three dimensions. And every one of those transistors is basically one little memory cell, a bit. Right? And so the chip was one centimeter roughly. We cut out 10 by, by 5 by 4 micron piece. That's what you're seeing here. 
what I still find mind-boggling, this little chip there, and there's eight of those in one of the chips that you have in this hard drive or in this uh, uh, um, SDS drive. If you look up how many humans ever lived on this planet, there's an estimation 107 billion. That, that chip has 128 billion transistors. So you can flag every single person that lived on this planet with just that one chip. And of course, they're making similar impressive numbers per minute. Uh, the holes uh, that you've seen when you looked at the bottom there, I don't know if it's now, it's not starting. But So here you see these columns, right? And the size, the diameter of, of each of those holes is 110 nanometers. And this is stuff that they do in volume production. And every single hole has to work. Well, actually, they can afford a couple that don't. But uh, the logic guys can't. So when you buy a processor, pretty much every transistor has to work. Um, since I'm an old guy, I do remember the Cray-1. Who does not know what that is? Well, that's not a good question. Who knows what the Cray-1 is? Us, equal, equally many people raising their hand. So when I was a student, I saw this picture, and I still remember it to this day. That was so cool. They did supernova expl explosions they simulated on this thing. Right? That was the first real supercomputer. Eight megabytes of memory. Amazing. 5.5 tons, <laughs> as heavy as an elephant. 150 kilowatt power supply. And I, I went on... Uh, Wikipedia and I pulled up, it had 160 million instructions per second. It did have quite an impressive mega flop number though, I have to say. So uh, in 2013, I got a five, iPhone 5S and I compared the specs. So I didn't know that I basically with having this iPhone at my pocket, I have about 100 crays, cray ones. This is how the shrink and how this uh, technology moved on. And of course you might think, yeah, that's pretty impressive. So I have already a hundred crays on a three-year-old uh, iPhone. What do you do with it? Where, where do we go, right? And so I don't know about you, but every time I use Siri, I'm thinking this is cool on one side, right? So once you get used talking to your phone, then you actually get annoyed quite quickly. <laughs> and so Siri is pretty dumb. I personally think moving forward in time, uh, the next big, but that's my personal opinion, so the next big quantum leap like the iPhone was will be when you actually really have a effortless voice interaction with your, with your device. And I think we're probably not all too far away from that uh, scenario. Who, who has seen that movie? Not very many. Watch it. It's good. So, chips are made with light. Right? So, to, in order to make all those devices, we use optics. And that basically gives you quickly... I, I, talk too fast so you, you have a, a layer of photosensitive resist and you do this here in house I know so you're probably familiar with this and then once you have the photoresist structured and developed you can do process steps and then you, now you have something on your chip and now you can start building your chip layer by layer by layer to a functioning device so you're, you're using light and when you use light and you want to get small you need to understand what's your resolution of your system and there is a guy who actually joined Carl Zeiss at some point uh, as a business partner partner uh, Ernst Abe he came up with the basically the concept is in order to get a decent image you need to at least capture the plus minus first order of your diffracted light uh, with your numerical aperture of your optics and then uh, in about 100 years later, Bern Lin, a lithographer from TSMC, he introduced in papers that K1 parameter. So the, the smallest feature size is lambda 
uh, the wavelength divided by the numerical aperture times a a magic factor that k k1 and that k1 ideally it can't be smaller than a, a quarter uh, and i don't have the time to dive into this but you're probably familiar with this anyway uh, if you do this you're running your your limit at its uh, your system at its cutoff so you can't really think about doing a volume production process with this that runs right at the cutoff but you can be very close and I have seen customers bringing it 0.04 away from that 0.25 uh, and running production. But if you want to shrink your CDs, which Moore's Law, uh, Moore's Law basically was formulated years ago, I think everybody's familiar with, that the essentially the number of transistors doubles every 18 months. And uh, in order to do this, you have to make things smaller, so that has been driving the requirements for the optics. So lithography seriously started with G-Line, 400 and, Tom help me, 36 or something nanometers. Oh yeah, there, there it is. Uh, I started working at Zeiss at the time, at this time here, eye line 365 nanometers. Then there was a transition to a laser base that is a krypton fluoride laser. And of course, each of those different wavelengths, you need to have a completely new different lens design. Also, so that's the wavelength bringing down. You increase the NA, you uh, increase resolution. So these systems back there, I don't remember, 0.3 NA or something like this. This system had a 0.5-ish, I think, NA. Those here went up to 0.8 NA. Then in ARF, we went up to 0.93 NA. And uh, K1, that's, K1 is not controlled by the optics guy. So K1, I didn't mention this. So K1 is the contrast of your photoresist. Some is optics, the source shape that you use. So if you use a coherent illumination or a, uh, a, a completely incoherent illumination or annular illumination or dipole illumination that helps you enhance your uh, resolution. So that, we, that part of K1 we own, but then photoresist contrast, uh, development tricks and other tricks that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, help also bring this down. So uh, we ran out of NA. NA of 1 is the limit, so 0.93 is pretty close to this. And I do remember, and I will always remember this, and you probably too, in the early 2000s, uh, I met Tom Milster in one of the conferences, and we had a coffee instead of listening to the talks, and uh, which was a lot nicer, actually. And... Uh, he asked me about, could you use immersion? And of course, as a Zeiss guy, I know immersion. That's these gooey oils that you put onto your object, and then you dump your microscope lens into this. And I was thinking, OK, at this time, we've already made scanners. A scanner instead of a stepper means you have a wafer. Wafers is back then, they were 8 inch. Uh, the imaging field is actually much smaller than that, so you have many images on that wafer. And so you expose, move, expose, move, expose, move, and so on. The scanners only use a slit of illumination and a slit of the lens. And then they move the mask through the slit and they follow this with a wafer. So you scan, you move, you scan, you move. And uh, so there's a lot of movements involved. By the way, now these systems here, we're having uh, 300 millimeter wafers. We have 100 fields per wafer. And these systems expose 230 wafers per hour. 230 wafers per hour, 100 fields. And then for each exposure, the wafer stage and the reticle stage fly, nanometer synchronized. 
Um, so he came and asked me, could you use immersion? And I burst out laughing. And I said, well, yes, but, you know, the customers won't appreciate us putting goo on these structures. And sure enough, this guy that I mentioned earlier, Berlin, Berlin, he was a big pusher for immersion lithography. And he gave papers and he showed, no, there's no technical roadblock. And he was right. I was wrong. He was right. So we built these immersion systems, also 193, with water as immersion liquid. And uh, the uh, NA is 1.35. So this is basically two days workhorses when you buy advanced chips. And now going further down the roadmap, there's a big transition of wavelength from 193 to 13.5 nanometers. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a little while. Now, uh, EUV has been in the news and has been discussed for years now. One of the issues that EUV used to have is we had the lenses, we had everything in place, but we didn't have the l source power for the light source to support large numbers of wafers to be printed. And that's why EUV did not arrive in the volume fabs as of today, by the way. So uh, EUV is being used and embraced by the industry in R&D. In order to get into the volume fabs, we'll still have to do some homework on the source power, but we're pretty well on track in the meantime on this. Uh, for the time being, the industry didn't stop. So when you plug in those numbers in that equation, where was it? Uh, I have it on the bottom of the slide, actually, on the top of the slide. Uh, 0.27, so that's a little more than 0.25, which I've seen people do. 193 nanometers, 1.35, and then you do this little equation, you find out the smallest feature that you can print is 38.5 nanometers. Dense uh, lines and spaces, right? So uh, what now? How do you get smaller? And since we didn't have EUV ready to go into volume, the industry had to find workarounds. And one of those is one of the things that I don't have on the slide is you can do double exposure. So you expose half of your lines with one sequence, develop them, and then you expose the other one and print them in between. And now you have doubled your pitch. And this is actually done today. And there's another method which is also quite cool. It's called spacer assisted double or here in this case quadruple patterning because you can cascade this. So what you're doing is you're starting with a photoresist that you expose with lithography. So this is 40 nanometers lines and spaces. And now you put an atomic layer deposition on this and uh, you know wash it away and then you have some of this atomic layer deposited material at the sidewalls of these resist lines. And then you remove the resist and you have doubled your pitch. Right? And now you can repeat this sequence and you double your pitch. Oh, sorry, here, we go this direction. Right? So here we remove the green stuff and then we repeat this de deposition again and Take, uh, take out what we don't need and we, we, you, you basically can quadruple your pitches or you could even add one more step. So there's actually a sequence. Problem is every time you add one of those steps it becomes more expensive. Now that's a great technology to make lines and spaces. Chips however are not exactly lines and spaces so you have to do something. One thing is the industry tries to go to uh, chip design. Yes. Yes, I have a question. It's not quite clear why the industry wants to go smaller and smaller. I mean, I can just find out if there is a large volume uh, to, to save power, because power is the ultimate criterion, I could say, and speed, right? But uh, are these strong? No. So a, a very strong drive is economy. It's basically. The, on the smaller area you can build your chip, even if the chip has the same, the same performance, 
if you make everything smaller, you can, with your same equipment, make twice the amount of output. And then the chip becomes cheaper. Another aspect of Moore's law that I did not mention is that the cost per chip also goes down. Right? So, so there's a, that's a very strong component to this, is economy. Yes, and I actually I would even go as far as saying if the business case is not there anymore to reduce feature sizes, then it won't happen. Simple as that. But as long as we can economically benefit from making features smaller, then of course we can also utilize all the cool things that come with it, right? Having cell phones that you can talk to or stuff like this. Or, you know, the, uh, the graphics. Uh, I heard once a, a presentation from a, a CEO of uh, one of the graphic board makers. Forgot the name. Uh, but, you know, the, the graphics board in your computer, those are, th that guy says, every transistor that you can give me more, I have use for it. So you ca I can never have enough transistors on my device, right? So the, and nowadays you use these graphics boards for mu mu uh, massive multitasking, uh, but also memory. I mean, we all know this. I remember when I bought my first PC, I had the choice of a 25 megabyte hard drive or a 30. And I thought, I'm not somebody who collects software, so 25 will last me a lifetime. Now I'm, take <laughs> now I'm taking a picture with my camera, and that would fill my hard drive on my first computer. So, so this is basically, you have a technology drive, you have applications that you can think of, and more applications even that you can fulfill with technology, but the, the business side of it is really what's driving it. It's ugly to say this, but this is how it is. Um, so, going back to this, so what, co what companies do is they try to make their chip devices. If you think about a chip, it's in the end, it's transistors, layers of lines, right? So when I was younger, I thought a, transistor, uh, a chip has transistors, has uh, capacitors, has uh, uh, resistors. No, they really have transistors and lines. That's all they do. And the smart chip designers, they make sure that the capacitances that they get with their lines and the resistivities that are there anyway, that they're being used intelligently. But you have layers of metal connections and interconnections. And uh, they make those very regular and then all you do is you do a grading, and then later on you remove what you don't need. That's these last couple of steps, right? Where you basically, you make additional uh, exposures. Could also be spacers, right? If you need smaller dimensions, and then you etch out what you don't, don't want. So this is in a nutshell, and of course it's much more complex that I'm representing it here, uh, how you make those devices and how you are able to go well below these 40 nanometers optical resolution by these processing tricks. So, and this is also an interesting curve that I stole from uh, an iMac presentation. Uh, this is a log of the, what does it say, transistors per dollar. So there is the economy coming back in here. Um, over the years, and of course, every one of those nodes of these, of these numbers here is associated with a feature size. So that's what you see added here, right? And what we're trying to do is we're climbing up this. We, we want more transistors, and we want to get every transistor cheaper. And back then, that was the time when I started. That was the golden area, era. You, you just made a new lens, and you get makes things smaller and it was wonderful. It was beautiful. And then eventually you run into trouble and then you have to think of optimizing your illumination, bringing in polarization, uh, bringing in this spacer stuff that I just showed you, 
brings us down to 20 nanometers. And now this is where something started that I already mentioned briefly, design technology co-optimization. That means the chip designer accounts in his chip design for the limitations of what you can do with optics. And that basically together will keep us on, on the path to ever smaller features and ever cheaper transistors. And this is about, you see the world ends in 2025. As a matter of fact, there might be good reason, reason to think it might end before that. Uh, but this is where we're going, and we think that EUV will come in around this uh, effective feature size number here. So let's talk about EUV. And I just give you an example. This is a clip of a metal layer. So this will be then, you know, lines that connect different transistors and different uh, functional areas. Uh, if you do this, and I don't know exactly which technology node this belongs. This is probably N7 or N5. Uh, um, which is, of course, even today, so uh, the five nanometer technology, the uh, uh, research is already ongoing, of course. Uh, if you want to print this with 193 nanometers, you have to split this mask in three different masks because otherwise you can't resolve this thing. Right? So you have to have a triple exposure weight. One, two, three, I think three, yes. And then once you're done printing this, you can kind of get what you want, but what you really wanted was this gray stuff here, right? So that's what, you, what's, what the designer had in mind when he talked about this. And we're getting close, and the, you, you can probably make a functioning device with this. Now these red curves here, that's what you call a process variability, meaning, when you expose something on your scanner, uh, your scanner will not be in perfect focus. So you have a focus budget, which is small. We're talking 50, 70 nanometers, right, where you really need to stay. Uh, so you do have a variation in focus. You do have a variation in dose. And that variation results in these feature getting bigger and smaller. And so these thick red lines are basically telling you what will be the variation if you go through your dose and focus window. If you do this same exposure with one exposure in EUV, you get much closer to where you want it, and it's also the variability is smaller. So there's a couple of good reasons, despite the technological uh, challenges uh, to... Uh, to continue with EUV, but EUV is a challenge in itself. EUV is strongly absorbed by known materials, even by air. So we have to do everything that we do in vacuum. But of course, we're, you think about doing this in a volume production. You can't put your entire fab in vacuum. That'll kill your technicians. So. <laughs> So you need to make sure you can do these 200 or 150 or whatever wafers per hour. Load it into your, you know, like a spaceship. You have the, what's that called where you go in? They have these two doors. The airlock, right? So get the wafer in there, get it exposed, get it out there very quickly. You can only use mirrors because there's no lenses that you can make at that wavelength. That is also true for the mask, right? So you saw, you saw this little video. Everything that you print, you have somewhere on a mask. All those masks are transmissive. So the, our photo masks need to be mirrors because we can't shine light through the mask. Uh, the, everything that you have, its refractive index is very close to one. Now make a mirror with a material that has the same refractive index as air. That's kind of a challenge. So the only way to do this is you do multi-layer coatings and you generate a Bragg, Bragg reflector, basically. What we do today is we have uh, alternating molybdenum silicon multi-layers. And they 
can be shown theoretically. I think the theoretical best you can get out of a mirror is 72% or something like this when you take the material constants and you do your thin film calculations. Um, we can actually achieve today real 70%, right? So 30% light loss on every single surface that your light gets along, yes? Manage it. But this is a very, very good question, right? So uh, yeah, I will show you a little later on a, a, a complete optical train. But I can tell you the essential right now, a EUV system is a very, very expensive beam dump, right? You have a sun on one side and photons trickling out on the other side. Uh, so you need to make sure that you really don't use any more mirrors that you really have to have. And you have to make very, very strong use of deviations from spherical surfaces. And uh, there it is. This is uh, a basically a schematic of a 3300 system. So that's what is at customer R&D sites today. So how does this work? First, we have a plasma source. I will get back to what that is. But that thing here creates, that little bubble there, creates 13 nanometer light. It is collected by this collector and focused into the intermediate focus. So here, now I have a image of that, of that spot. Now, as I mentioned earlier, so far we would have a system with a coherent illumination. Right? Coherent illumination, not good for printing small things. So we need to turn this point source into some annular or dipole shaped for lithography. And that is done by these mirrors. So this is that we have a field facet mirror and the pupil facet mirror. They're basically in conjugate planes of pupil and field. And they make multiple copies of that same drop or of that same point source and draw the illumination shape that we want. And that's basically achieved by this optics. And then you hit your photo mask. And so we shine onto the photo mask. And then you image the photo mask using this light through this optics onto the wafer. You have a four times reduction. So the, everything that's on the mask is four times larger than what you print on the wafer which we have today also in ARF. Uh, but something that's actually a little bit unfortunate, of course, here, you, ha you have to hit that mask under uh, an oblique angle. You can't have a perpendicular situation like in a, in a normal optical mask. A normal incidence, that's, that's the word. So you, you come under an angle, and so all your diffraction orders have angles. And of course, the smaller your features get, the larger the angular spread of your first orders. What did I miss? Oh yeah, that's just uh, the last one here. That just indicates the NA here. Uh, but there's nothing on, on this side. So the NA of your system is this angle here. The acceptance NA, of course, is who knows? An optics guy. Uh, why can't we do transmission because you, you, nothing transmits EUV. So I, so far, I only talked about the refractive index of one, but I only talked about the real part. The imaginary part of everything is not zero. So the moment you sink EUV into anything, it just disappears there. Oh, yeah. Uh, think about making a mask. So masks are six inch typically. And now you want to be in transmission. Uh, the mask will absorb a lot of that light too, right? And the mask moves very fast. 
you have vacuum, so that counts for it. But it's basically from stability considerations, you'll probably never get happy with a film. What you're thinking is like a very thin layer of metal. We're actually doing thin stuff, which I don't have in this presentation, is uh, the masks usually are covered with a pellicle, which is a very thin plastic layer today also, to prevent dust falling onto the reticle. And we realize we need this in EUV also, so we actually do shine to it through a thin film. But you also have to account for, and I think that's probably where the showstopper comes from, when you start making a mask in a film, you need to structure that film. The moment you structure it, you're cutting holes into this, it will stretch and change its positions. And of course, those devices that we're making require, at the time an EUV comes out, require maintaining the proper position within two and a half nanometers over this entire six inch. Right, so that means four times bigger on the mask, but still, that's still a very challenging task. So I think this is probably the reason why people said uh, don't don't do don't do these films. But that it's a good question, I think. Right, so the 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 showstopper comes in the practical implementation. So, but my question: so the NA on the bottom. And the NA at the in at the beginning is you have a four x reduction, so the NA at the entrance is four times smaller. So with this system, those are actual photoresist pictures. So thirteen nanometer half pitch, eighteen nanometer half pitch of contacts, and this is like a metal layer, for instance, with twenty na twenty three nanometer half pitch single exposure. So that's Easy peasy with uh, with EUV. With with ARF or optical, there's no way you can print any of this. So uh, let's look at a wafer. So that's schematic. I want to draw with this slide. I want to draw an analogy here. All right. So you think about you exposing a wafer. Every wafer has fields. The field size is 26 by 33 millimeters. That's the scan direction. And that's the field at wafer side. So if I now assume, uh, if I look at my EUV system as a information transfer, and I say I have pixels, right? So I can say I can safely assume a volume of 18 by 18 nanometers, I can have one point that doesn't talk to the other points. So I have basically, I'm thinking of 18 by 18 nanometer pixels, uh, which I use to fill this field here. So I have 26 millimeters divided by 18 gives me a couple million, uh, 1.4 million uh, pixels in X. 33 gives me 1.8 million pixels in Y. So I have two and a half, what's that, trillion pixels per field. So what a EUV system really is, is a terapixel printer. So if you now compare this with a 4K TV, it's 300,000 times what the resolution of a 4K TV is. So now I took the liberty and make a TV screen that has uh, basically, how did, uh, now I'm confusing myself. If I want to make a, a TV screen that has the resolution of a two days 4K TV screen, pixel size, then that TV screen would basically be as long as the highest building in the world would be tall. And that's what you do with one shot with EUV. And that, I think, is one of the reasons why, even though this is a very expensive technology, but it's still worth doing it because you're transferring so much information in an instant. So in order to look at the mirrors, we have to polish our mirrors down to 50 picometer RMS deviation from its intended 
uh, shape. And in order, just another analogy, I take this mirror now and blow it up to the size of Germany, which you know is a huge country in Europe. Uh, and then I look at what these 50 picometers mean, right? So here is, that's our highest mountain, proudly presented, Zugspitze, about 3,000 meters high. I don't know how high this is in feet, some 10,000 feet. Uh, in that same scale, the surface of the mirror could not have mountains higher than half a, a millimeter. So that's what we have to do when we make those mirrors for, uh, for EOV. And, and the way we do it, uh, we start with local polishing. So we have all these robots that basically have this little polishing pad. And as you know the surface and you know where you need to remove material, that robot follows the track. Uh, of course, you need very sophisticated metrology. I don't particularly like this picture, I have to say. That kind of looks like humans are involved, but they are really not. This is one of the first things that I learned, learned when I did uh, interferometry. Keep every heat source as far away as possible from your interferometer, right? And so... Uh, you, you build an interferometer, you have a little laser there, and you put this right next to your interferometer, you never get anywhere good. So all the lights, the sources, uh, heat sources are removed, including the person that used to put the mirror on, on the stage to measure it. We used to do this manually. With EUV, you can't afford doing this. You, can't, you don't have all these hours time to, for the mirror waiting to relax temperature-wise again. So we have a robot arm that takes the mirror through a window and then places it on the interferometry. And inside there is, of course, all kinds of uh, sophisticated metrology, as you are probably all used uh, to look at. Like we have uh, to make our reference wavefronts and so on. And so we have repeatability of about 10 picometers and a reproducibility of 20. And then as another step we use to, for the ultra fine figuring, we use atomic level, so we use ion beam polishing to get to the final uh, the quality of the surface. How are we doing? Now we're good. So now let's take these mirrors, put them in a lens and put it in the system. So this is what customers like Intel are buying. So you have uh, everything that's greenish here is EUV light. So you have the light source somewhere. You have the projection optics. You have a level sensor. What is the level sensor? Um, as you load the wafer onto your stage, the optics needs to know where that surface is. Right? So we have metrology that actually traces the entire surface of the wafer and keeps track of it because as we scan, the scanner follows this topography. Uh, we have, of course, improved air mounts, which is pretty cool because this thing is in vacuum, right? So uh, there's a whole lot of technology going in to keep the vacuum and the non-vacuum parts uh, apart while still interacting with each other. We have the smash sensor, which is, so the level sensor we talked is telling you where is the wafer height. But when you load the wafer, and if you think about the chip consists of layers of layers of layers, and each of those layers needs to fit to the layer below. So as you load your wafer, you need to know where that wafer is. And when you're going down to the nanometer level of accuracy of posi positioning, some guy once told me a wafer is like a piece of jello. It's not only just landing somewhere, it's also completely twisted and distorted. So every wafer has marks, set more than one, and then the, uh, where was it, uh, the smash sensor, which is an alignment system, measures where those marks are and thereby keeps track of the local distortion state of that wafer and makes sure that the next layer that's exposed is going to be aligned with that. 
uh, overlay setup that's related. Spotless, if you have a small piece of dust on your wafer stage and you put the wafer on there, you'll make a bump. A chip won't work, so we have to make sure the wafer stable, the table uh, stays clean. That's all stuff that ASML makes. Reticle stage, we need to have thermal control that was mentioned before, right? So as I said, this is a huge beam dump. So we're creating a lot of temperature and we need to make sure that the temperature is being taken care of before we expose anything, right? So that the mirror surfaces remain in place. So any optical surface that we have in there has a very, very sophisticated thermal management to get the heat off that the EUV light provides. Projection optics, uh, the illumination, we talked about this. Uh, now this system now brings a resolution of 16 nanometers, full wafer CDU, that means CD, we had that before, that's the critical dimension. CDU is the uniformity of that critical dimension across the entire wafer. So whatever we print there, the size of it is within less than 1.3 nanometers the same over the entire wafer. DCO is a term, an MMO, this is dedicated chuck overlay versus machine, matched machine overlay. These systems have two stages. Both of them can carry wafers and both of them will carry wafers. While one wafer exposes or is being exposed, the other stage does all the metrology smash UV level sensors. So one stage basically figures out where is the wafer and what's its topography while the other way exposes and then the waves the chucks are swapped. Wafer goes out, next wafer comes onto the metrology. So if you run match machine overlay, uh, this actually includes even that you can have another scanner exposing this thing. So you have a second machine standing there you expose one layer on this, and then you expose the other layer on this machine, the other machine, then we have to make sure that everything lands within two and a half nanometer of where it's supposed to land. Dedicated chuck is when you basically expose the same wa uh, the wafer on the same chuck on the same machine. Then we can bring it down to 1.5 nanometers. And it can do 125 wafers per hour. So not the 230 that I talked earlier, but 125. So we will get, have to get up to 230 by the time this goes into volume production. Now let's talk about the light source. That is a pretty cool thing. So it starts here. We're having a high power infrared laser, CO2 laser. It goes through a whole bunch of amplifiers, eventually goes into the cavity, here's vacuum, and there's a tin droplet generator. So think of an in inkjet printer, 50,000 droplets per second of liquid tin are shooting into this cavity and none of those droplets ever make it to the bottom. They all get shot by this CO2 laser that focuses on the droplet that comes in and turns it into a plasma. And that plasma radiates 13 nanometer light. And it radiates a whole bunch of other stuff, deep UV, heat, and splatter, right? So what of course happens, you shoot this thing and it just boom, explodes. And not all the tin converts into plasma. So now you have to make sure that you manage your debris because you don't want that stuff to land on the collector, which it does, by the way. So. Uh, but we need to keep this in a manageable, manageable situation. So we have all kinds of, still in vacuum, hydrogen flow. I think it's hydrogen. So directed particles flowing through, kicking the debris out that makes it close to the mirror. We're still missing some, and then eventually the mirror gets a haze of tin and eventually the mirror needs to be replaced. So the, that collector mirror is a consumable. So what you need to do is you need to make sure it, it remains in a realm where it's still economically viable. Uh, 
So you collect the light into the intermediate focus. There's tin flying in this direction also. So what's not even drawn here is um, there is m ways to catch the tin particles like with a rotating, uh, how do you call this, fly swatter basically, right? Uh, that tries to minimize the amount of tin going into there. We have a physical pinhole here. So because if you ever have a tin particle going in here, it'll land on something. And, it's, uh, and if it lands on a mirror, we can live for a while with it. If it lands on the mask, you're dead. Or the mask is dead. Right? So the high-power CO2 laser creating plasma, getting this here. 50,000 droplets per second, every single one you need to shoot. Now, the first system was a, I forgot the name of it. It was actually a pretty cool system because the droplets acted like a mirror. And they made that laser shoot, basically. When the droplet came in, the laser fired automatically. So it always would hit the droplet. But this conversion efficiency that you get there is not helping. So what we're doing now is we have a pre-pulse and the main pulse. And now you can't rely on those droplets to be mirrors again. Now you have to really aim and shoot and hit. And so the tin droplet comes in. And it's the problem is if it is a drop and you you have the laser hit that drop, a lot of the tin is not being converted because most of the tin is somewhere inside that sphere. So what you want is you want the shape rather than a drop be like a pancake. We do this with a pre-pulse. So we're hitting this thing with a relatively low energy, but the impact from the photons make it spin and rotate and it turns into a disk. And then a little further down, the main pulse comes in and has a nice large real estate that it can turn into plasma. And that was actually the breakthrough in terms of uh, conversion efficiency and source power. So this is what happens. All of this actively controlled. Uh, so this is basically um, Nomo. That was the that was the one that I said before. That's the uh, where the droplet was a mirror. So we could get up to uh, ten watt light sources. The uh, that's the power source, eight kilowatt. That's the CO two laser. Uh, then we could get up to fifty kilowatt by increasing the uh, infrared uh, power. We had a little less. Now what's the blue one? Uh, yes. So the blue one is when you do exposure, you really have to have a very stable exposure dose. Now, not every pulse gives you the same energy. So if you want to have a stable production, you need to expose with less, right? Because you want to be able to, as you expose, to adapt the power that you, that you make. So every feature sees about... 40 or 50 of those pulses. Uh, so that's what they call the dose overhead. So we needed to run basically the dose 55% lower than we could technically get from these 10 watt, which is a waste. So that's why we want this blue bar to go down. The red bar goes up. That's the uh, CO2 power. And this is the actual EUV power. So that was the status in 2014. Uh, we will be in 2018, we target for 250 watt on EUV. Uh, now, I didn't even mention the NA. So the 3300 system that I just introduced to you is a 0.33 NA. And of course, the roadmap doesn't stop there. We can't further shrink the wavelength. We can't reduce K1 much more, but we can do something with the NA. So with a 0.33 NA, we can basically, at a K1 of 0.3, we can resolve 12 nanometers. 
If we have an Na of 0.4, we can resolve 10 nanometers, 0 0.5, 8.1, 0 0.6, 6.8. So we will have to go to a larger Na, which is a challenge with a mirror system. Uh, and one of the consequences of using a mirror as a mask is depicted here. So this is the situation, right? So you have an incoming Na, which is smaller than the, four times smaller than the wafer Na. We come in and we go off. And since this Na has a certain angular extension, that determines what your angle of incidence needs to be. Because, of course, you can't have those things overlap. We call this angle here the crayle, or the, the half the angle is the crayle, chief ray angle at object. Now, uh, this is the relationship I already mentioned. So four times bigger in uh, uh, reduction ratio of four gives you an A of 0.33 here. And a 0.33 divided by four, I want, don't want to calculate this here. Uh, oh, here it is, 0.084. Now we're, uh, and you print a six inch mask, right? So this is the mass dimension, which then on the wafer comes to these 33 by 26. If we now, with a 0.33 and A, we have a six degree angle. If we want to go and maintain this six degree, and there's good reasons to maintain that angle, which I will get to in a second, uh, if we blow up the NA, then those things start to overlap. And then you can, then there, you know, the incoming light is in the way of the outgoing light, so that is not working. So now what do you do? One way, of course, is increasing the crayo, right, to have a larger angle of incidence. But when you look at these EUV coatings, those multilayers, molybdenum silicon, molybdenum silicon, of course, they are good reflectors for a small angle range. And as you go outside that angle range, the reflectivity is horrible. So if I come in under a certain angle, I have my NA here. And now this is, uh, there's a couple things that you need to think of here. That's why this is a little bit of a busy slide. One of the thing is, where is my light in the illumination? This is an example of a dipole illumination. Right, so we have light here and light here. Now this pole comes under a much smaller angle of incidence than this pole. And on top of it, we have a multilayer. A multilayer is a mirror, but it's kind of a weird mirror because it doesn't have one defined surface. The light sinks into that stack. So it's not a sharp mirror. So if I have a feature that I want to print and I'm coming under an angle, I get some sort of a shadowing effect here which makes my life not necessarily simpler. So those arguments, together with the, refract, uh, the reflectivity curves, asks for a angle of incidence to be not too much. So we can afford a maximum angle of some 12 degrees or so, but that's it, full NA, which means we don't really want our angle of incidence to be bigger than six uh, six degrees. Uh, that's the other aspect that comes in here. That pole gets reflected with more, tr with more uh, uh, efficiency than this pole. So now you introduce a kind of a telecentricity effect. And if the diffraction orders also suffer from this, on top of your telecentricity effect, you have a contrast loss. You don't want that. So what else can we do? Well, one way is, there you go. One way is we built a system that has a 4x magnification in the x direction and only a 8 or a 8x demagnification in the y direction. So now we have an elliptical entrance pupil. Of course, on the other side, on the wafer side, it will still be a circular 0.5 or something like this. NA. So on the wafer side, everything is conventional optic. But on the inside, basically, we have a different magnification in X and Y. 
Now this is uh, an, uh, another aspect of this, of course, is now our mask will be mapped only on half the field. So now we have a half field system. So we need to stitch more and expose more fields per wafer. Um, uh, this is an, a simulation that shows uh, uh, imaging simulation. So if we have a 0.33 NA system, a 6% a 6 degree angle of incidence, and we have a 4X system, uh, and we print 15 nanometer uh, lines and spaces in horizontal direction, we have a contrast of about 80, 80 what, 84 percent. If we now go to 0.45 NA, which, you know, you go to higher NA, you expect to have a better resolution, a better contrast, but we are actually losing contrast because of what I just mentioned. The, the, uh, as this would be for 11, corresponding to the same kind of uh, filling of the uh, pupil, uh, with a, but with an angle of incidence here of 9 degrees. Now, if we do this anamorphic system, we can get back to the 6 degree angle and go to an NA even higher than 0.5 and print 8 nanometer lines at about the same contrast as we had at the 15 millimeter lines at 0.33 NA. So this is the way to go. And of course, this is a revolutionary idea which nobody ever thought, oh, wait. So uh, the film industry did this already for quite some time, right? So when the white cinema widescreen came up and the, film, the movie industry, you have these standard format films. And now if you go to a widescreen, you would actually, you would waste your film material. So what they did is they, they take an anamorphic lens to record the image and then they take another anamorphic lens to project it on the screen. So anamorphic imaging is actually uh, nothing new, no, but it is new in lithography. So if your electronic circuit design looks like this, you want to look at like this on the wafer, then you have to build a mask that looks like this. It's stretched. So this is going to be the, the uh, future of EUV in the 2020-ish, 2022 range, those systems will make the chips. And maybe at this time we can really have a meaningful conversation with Siri, I hope. So just to give you a impression, this is uh, just a relative comparison that the first EUV system that we built was kind of like a, a learn and play tool at a 0.25 NA. 0.33 NA is bigger. 5 NA or larger than 0.5 is going to be really huge. Right, but we still think that's all something we can do. And uh, this is basically how the future is going to look like. So let me summarize. Let me see how I'm doing. Oh, almost spot on. Uh, immersion lithography, what I talked about at the beginning, will of course continue to be used. Uh, but EUV is in the meantime embraced by the main players in the industry. Strong push from Intel, strong push from TSMC and Samsung uh, to bring EUV out in a timely fashion. We've already been late with it. Uh, will certainly enable a further shrink and at the same time be cost effective. Right. So this is the, the, the big thing is if EUV wouldn't be able to give the same result that you can get with alternative at a lower price, EUV would not be used. Today, we think that when the industry needs to do to triple patterning, basically pitch tripling, that's the cost crossover where EUV becomes more economically feasible. Uh, anamorphic lithography is making high NA EUV lithography, uh, a possibility that we can uh, uh, also economically pursue. And uh, of course, everything is very challenging and exciting to almost a level of insanity. So, but it's, it's uh, 
crazy when you look at what, what, what these systems do and what they're supposed to do, and it's also amazing that, that we were able, with the entire industry, to get there. That's all I have to say. I need to put my acknowledgement slide up here. Um, thank you for listening. Any questions?